There are few greater challenges than saving lives after serious injuries. You're shot, you have to go to the operating room. I'm Dr. Kevin Fong. I want to see for myself how lives are saved in some of the world's most extraordinary trauma centers. This guy stabbed in the chest with a screwdriver, he's fully arrested. Here we go. As a doctor, I've seen a lot. Hey! Motherfucker! But you've never seen it all. I'll be joining ER doctors across the world who are amongst the best at dealing with extreme trauma from car crashes to stab wounds and gunshot victims. Did you get assaulted too or just shot? I've been given special access to get up close and see these elite teams in action to learn the lessons that might improve our own A&Es. I want to learn the secrets of these trauma units and how they manage to save lives that would otherwise be lost. I want to show you the world of trauma medicine through a doctor's eyes. This week, Johannesburg and a trauma unit with an extraordinary record in treating patients. You can feel the heart onto your hands. A man who's attacked during a barroom brawl must be treated with limited resources. Do we have the sternal saw and is it working? A father of two young daughters is here with a suspected broken neck after a major car crash. And trainee doctors have to fight for the life of a man who's been stabbed in the heart with a screwdriver. I'm proud of myself that I finally did it. I'm in Johannesburg, and as soon as I arrive, I can feel the buzz. 11 million people, all told, and it's the busiest economy in South Africa. But Johannesburg is also one of the world's most violent cities. Over 3,000 murders a year, 25 times as many as we see in London. This makes it a magnet for doctors around the world who want to gain experience on trauma's front line. You know, there's a few places in medicine that are legendary, and the trauma units in Johannesburg are amongst those. And, and so it's one of those places that you've heard about, you know, in sort of medical urban legend ever since you were a medical student. And I've been curious to come here for all of that time. I'm spending a week with the trauma teams here at the Charlotte McClecke Hospital. With Joburg's reputation for violence, it's a daunting prospect. I'm Kevin. I'm Kevin Fong. I'm a doctor from London. Oh, okay. Come, come, come to look at the trauma unit. Hi, hi, hi. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Brilliant, thank you. So these are the uh, trauma unit scrubs, complete with their trauma unit logo. Joburg Hospital trauma unit. Oh, nice patch. The trauma team here see over 2,000 critically injured people every year. Way more than back home. I want to check out the logbook to see what the doctors here are really up against. Uh, I was interested in seeing your injuries book of all the people who come through who, the resus room. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, wow. Gosh, what you got? Stabbing, stabbing. Stabbing, 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 all of these stabbings. These are non-trivial injuries. You know, these are people who need a lot of work immediately. Nine out of 10 patients admitted as emergencies to this trauma unit survive. With the severity of cases seen, that's impressive. And even more so when you consider how limited the resources are. And unusually for a trauma unit, there's no early warning system. You don't get so much as a phone call. No one even gives you a call from the scene here. It just turns up in front of those doors, in front of Casualty 163. And whatever it is, whatever part of the body, whether it's someone bleeding to death, or someone who's a near drowning or a victim of burns, whatever it is, they just have to cope with it. 
It isn't long before there's a victim of violent crime through the front door. Nadir, what is it? The doctor on duty tonight is UK consultant Sarah Asbury. What happened to you? Hey, this guy they wanted to kill me. Oh. Was it a bottle or a knife? Shit. The patient is barely in his 20s. Bongani and Kube was in a bar when an argument started and he was stabbed twice in the chest. You've got decreased breath sound on the right hand side. That's an ominous sign. It could mean a dangerous quantity of blood has collected around Bongani's lung. This is the gentleman's quite impressive chest x-ray and complete whiteouts on this side and that hazy shadowing is because there's blood the right side of his chest full of blood but that's not the end of his problems mainly in him my concern is that he's got a stab to the he's got a stab um to the pericardium to the heart in which case we need to take him straight to theater one stab wound is very close to his heart in about the worst place it could be and that second wound is over his lung in front of some major blood vessels the team must clear that blood from around his lung. To do that, they have to push a tube through the muscle of his chest wall and drain it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. But when they do, the bleeding doesn't stop. It's 1,200 there. Including, including the 500 or on top of? The team now have no choice but to take Bongani to theatre and open his chest. Bongani then asks a nurse to phone his sister and tell her that he's dying. Either his lung or his heart is damaged and he's now bled enough to earn, his, earn the right to have his chest open. He's continuing to drop into that chest drain, so he needs his lung looked at at the least of things. And going, because he's got bilateral stabs and you can't see where, which one could be causing the problem, a sternotomy is probably the wisest <coughs> incision. Before opening Bongani's chest, Sarah and her colleague Asila investigate the knife wound to see where it leads. Stick your finger in there. Right over the heart. Right on the fiddle. <laughs> you can feel the heart yeah. onto your hand. Yeah. Miraculously, the knife has missed Bongani's heart by just a few millimeters. Bloody hell. I can't believe that. How did it miss? <laughs> The gods are truly with him. It looks like the pericardium is clean. Yeah, it still leaves us with a problem of 1.6 litres in his chest. The heart is uninjured, but Sarah must still open Bongani's chest and find the source of bleeding to save his life. Sarah is going to do a stenotomy, which means she's going to open the chest from here to down to about here. And then she's going to open the chest so she can get a more direct view of the heart and the lungs. You can cut through the sternum in seconds, but only if you've got a powered saw. OK, tell me and make me happy. Do we have the sternal saw and is it working? Because last time, Prof had to use a bone cutter. Who's got the pedal? I've got the pedal. This is really bullshit. The saw has packed up, so Sarah has to fall back on more traditional methods. Cover your eyes, yeah. yeah. Good old fashioned hammer and chisels. OK, 
Okay, can we have the ribs straight? Can I have another glove, please? Another size seven glove? Sarah identifies the cause of bleeding, an artery in the lung, and fixes it. Sarah is from the UK and initially came here on sabbatical to learn from the heavy caseload. Once he's here, that you can make more of a difference in a day than uh, a week uh, working in the UK. The nice thing about trauma patients is you catch a guy who is walking down the street, he gets stabbed in the heart, he comes into the unit dead, essentially. You can open his chest, you can see that stab in the heart, you can oversew it in the emergency room, and the heart starts beating it. It wants to beat, and it starts beating again. And the next day, their, their tube can come out, they can be sitting up. Day two, three, four, they can be out to the ward, out of hospital in a week. Back in the trauma unit, I want to meet some of the junior doctors here who are fresh out of medical school. How many years post-qualification are you? Um, I just completed my internship in 2008, so I'm looking at... This is my third year. It's three years since you left medical, medical school. school, yeah. Right, 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 right. Basically, you're coming up to three years post-graduate. Yeah. That's right, OK. Oh, so, so still quite, quite... In fact, you're less than three years after medical school. I'm less than three years. I'll be three oh. years in four months. OK, all right. <laughs> and before you did this, how much trauma had you done? I haven't done any trauma, because I'm from Kenya, and uh, we hardly see stabbings, gunshots, uh, but uh, here, I mean, it's totally different. So, so I mean, it must have been quite a jarring experience for you, have you? Yeah, when, when we came in for the first time, it was uh, a bit scary. So it was a very steep learning curve. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's like a crash course, <laughs> but uh, you cope with it. With over 700 stab victims through the doors each year, junior doctors learn fast and need to be ready to step up far quicker than in other places. Dr. Dean Gersom is one of the youngest members of the trauma team. You're how old now? You're I'm 25. 25. Yeah. So, gosh, you've grown up in a very interesting time. What, just tell me a bit about how you've seen things change. So, I mean, I was born at this hospital in 1985, and when this hospital was a whites-only hospital, it is a huge change. I mean, my, my class in medicine, we, we graduated a year ago. You know, if, if you would have seen our class photo that was uh, black, white, Indian, um, and yeah, it's amazing that the med school and the hospital have... Uh... Do you hear that? Go, you guys go, don't stab out. <laughs> Uh, he was stabbed with a screwdriver. Um, looks like it's going through, loose in the top of the heart. She says 15 out of 15 initially. Um, quite stable, just complaining of a slight shortness of breath. As we loaded him, we got him to the ambulance. He stopped breathing, um, went into a PA of 40. We've been doing CPR. He's had three doses wow. of adrenaline, one dose of atropine. Uh, seven minutes of CPR. So. Uh, this guy, penetrating chest trauma, stabbed in the chest. And with a screwdriver, he's fully arrested. All the team know is that the patient, a middle-aged man, has been attacked on the street. This is going to have to be very slick here, I think, uh, if to have any chance of saving this guy's life. He's taken a penetrating injury, I think, to the centre of his chest. Uh, and either there's a hole in his heart and he's bled out through that hole, or he's got a tension pneumothorax. Uh, or he's got blood around his heart, stopping his heart from beating. First to respond are two of the recently graduated doctors, Nick and Nabil. So the paramedics are just talking about the period of time for which they've been resuscitating him, and uh, so they've been going through the standard advanced life support protocols for resuscitation, giving them adrenaline and continuing CPR. That's what's going on here. You can see their cardiac massage obviously in progress. They've intubated him to try and secure his airway. Uh, about as serious as anything's going to get. At the Charlotte McCleckay Trauma Unit, doctors are battling to save a man who's been stabbed in the chest with a screwdriver. Yes. 
up on the monitor, it's very difficult to get any meaningful information out of that right now. The resuscitation is in progress. You can't really reliably monitor the flow of electricity across the heart because there's so much disturbance of the electrodes. But whoever you are, you don't want your monitor to look like that. The most senior doctor working this case is a sealer. It's the younger doctors that have to take charge here. Uh, Sila has just made an assessment of this patient. That, uh, uh, she's given the long length of time that he's been down uh, without, without an output. Um, and, and the amount of resuscitation that he's undergone, she thinks that the chances of any recovery are vanishingly slim and she's gonna now wait for another couple more cycles of resuscitation and if there isn't some change and this very very unlikely to be uh, they'll, they'll call it a day and pronounce him dead Uh, pronounced this man dead. Um, he was very severely injured and uh, at the outset really had had a long period where his heart hadn't beaten, um, during which, uh, uh, as a result of having been assaulted and stabbed. Um, and the team kept the resuscitation going uh, until it really looked futile. And, uh, I think they're all agreed that they've decided to stop. Yeah. We gave him the necessary drugs, CPR, and give it a chance, but no. Professor Jacques Houston arrives to debrief his junior team and reassures them that they've handled the case in the right way. I've not managed to get the pericardial synthesis back. And our study which we did here, fairly big study, shows that you've got a 16% survival of the precordial stab if you arrive with a sign of blood. For the rest, you're wasting your time. You're no use to anyone. You're absolutely no use to anyone if you go home every day uh, and cry yourself to sleep. Uh, and equally, you're completely useless to the patient if you just think that they aren't a person that 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 you know that you forget that uh, and so you kind of walk this tightrope the whole of your professional career I think um, and that's what you learn to do now uh, I think that's that's part of the job there's good news though for the first stab victim I'd yeah, seen treated here Bongani and Kube, the young man attacked in a bar, has made a full recovery. In my mind, I was thinking maybe I'm going to die. I was shouting to the doctor that I'd taken, phone my sister, telling my sister that I'm dying here. Yeah. They say that ah, you are not going to die. I can say to my doctors, all of them, I can say thanks for what they've done to me because they do something that they, that helps my life. This young man has a future to look forward to. But in Johannesburg, extreme cases like this are all too common. And for the junior doctors themselves, trauma is very much part of their lives. What made you want to be a doctor in the first place? Um, well, um, in 1993, we had an accident, so I lost both my parents, and I was in the hospital for quite some time. So I got to interact a lot with the nursing staff, the doctors, the surgeons, and I said, you know what? Hey, I'm going to become a doctor. Simple. Somehow in my mind, I had this fairy tale picture of being a doctor where, you know, everything goes okay and there's no drama and you are always helpful and 
But it's not necessarily like that. It's it's more. I think the only difference is that it's it's the real world. It's actually hardcore stuff that you have to know, that you get exposed to, that you experience. At the end of the day, I don't regret. It. It's it's part of me, I guess. My profession and my life are all one big thing. On the night shift, I watch Crystal and Rizwan deal with a flood of emergencies, including five resus cases. The gentleman here at the moment is a pedestrian who's been hit by a motor vehicle, multiple injuries. He came in at a depressed conscious level. He may have a, a, a evolving bleed in his brain. This next bay, we have a gentleman who's a victim of assault. He came in nearly unconscious, just there. There's a gentleman who was stabbed and, uh, and a victim of assault with a stabbing and some blunt trauma. And finally, this gentleman who fell off a lorry, fractured his skull. He has bleeding in and around his brain. Basically, he's broken his neck. John, please lie to him, OK? I just Wait, need a sample of your blood, OK? All right? Some pretty terrible things come through here. And as an individual, how do you, you, know, how do you feel about that? You have a patient, saving his life is a priority. So um, that kind of feeling doesn't go through my mind at that time because you need to, your priority is to save his what life. What about afterwards? Afterwards, yeah, you feel a bit down because, I mean, this is a reflection of the kind of society you live in because tomorrow you could be the one on this stretcher, you know? So it does make you think twice. He's got a stab on the right posterior knee. When you hear about this place before you visit it, you kind of half expect to find a, a whole cohort of, of junior doctors who are just ground down by the system, who have got that thousand-yard stare, because it is austere in terms of the length of the hours that they work, in terms of the things that they're asked to do, uh, uh, and the horrible things that some of them have to see, and that's not what you find. You find a bunch of doctors who very much enjoy their experience, work extremely hard, but, but find it enjoyable and uplifting. And, and that is remarkable, and, and that it's very hard to construct that, I think. This is now the sixth resuscitation of the evening. I think I caught a snippet of a story about a car catching fire, and this patient was dragged from that car. His name is Shalom Khan. He's 25 years old and the father of two young daughters. His car is hit from behind very fast, hard enough that it spun the car around. The car then collided with a post, burst into flames. That well, sounds like one hell of a smash. Shalom's mother drove past the aftermath of the crash on her way to the hospital. When I saw the car, I thought, no, he can't be alive. You, you passed the, the car on the way that Shalom had yes, crashed in. Yes. Uh, when so was... when I saw the car, totally, I I freaked out. Why I looked that bad? <laughs> Shalom may have survived the car wreck, but he could have life-threatening internal or spinal injuries. He's got spinal pain. Yeah, yeah he has he severe has, has spine tenderness. You can see the red mark the seatbelt has cut into his chest. While his body has been held in place, his head will have been thrown forward by the impact of the crash. Shalom may have broken his neck, so any further jolt to the spine could cause paralysis. But the team have to turn Shalom around to examine him for further injuries. I'm going to feel for your spine. If you feel pain, say yes. Don't shake your head, OK? Do you understand? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand that. Okay. It's a critical moment, and there's a new arrival in the room. Steve Moeng is head of the unit and has 20 years' experience of trauma behind him. At the vital point, I watch him take over. Can you change the spine control? You'll want to come to the neck this side so that okay. he can be able to have more space to remove the stuff all the way I'll up. I'll take okay. over C spine from this side. Okay. We're going to do it as a unit. One guy will be slightly lifting up the pelvis, another one will be taking up the shoulders up here. And somebody has to come in and pull the Kendrick all the way up. Okay. One, two, three.
Middle tone, normal, prostate prep, uh, normal position. Okay. Just relax, man. We're going to do a couple of scans on you just to make sure you're all right, okay? Okay? So, chill out. Shalom's scan shows he's had a lucky escape. He fractured two vertebrae in his neck, but thankfully, his spinal cord is uninjured. I think I'm very lucky. Um, I've learned to listen, you know, in life, you know. It's just a lesson, be safe. I couldn't, like, move or do anything for almost two weeks. I was just laying in bed and so on, you know, like, like a vegetable. Right, and then after that, started fighting it and walking and so on. The friend who was in the car with him wasn't so lucky. The same night the accident happened, he was sent to a, another hospital. I didn't know how he was doing. Next day when I got home, um, got hold of his family, and they told me he had serious, serious, very serious head injury. He was in a coma for a month. Two, three days after his birthday, you know, he passed away. Next morning, I'm with Dr. Steve Moeng as he puts his team through their paces on the daily ward round. What would be your biggest concern about potential developments and possibly... Dr. Moeng had taken charge of Shalom's treatment and is now turning the case into a stern test for his juniors. He's the same guy. Look at this, man. I think their wedding is out, is that it does not prevent you from going to renal failure. Full stop. Looking at what specifically? If there's any reconnection or if there's an abscess. Okay, collection, abscesses, what else? Okay, it's good to diagnose. <coughs> okay, it's adequate. It's not great. But yes, it's... it's the lines, is it still got central lines and other stuff? Pardon? Why does it still need it? This is at least as horrible as any war drowned I ever okay. experienced as a trainee. Does it change the outcome and mortality? Million dollar question. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm interested to hear from Dr. Mo Wang and see what he thinks it takes for the trainees to make it in the world of trauma. Steve, thanks very much for taking the time to see me. It's a pleasure, bro. The ability to make decisions under pressure, <laughs> and hopefully the right ones. <laughs> OK, at least most of the time they should be the right ones. Uh, that, that, to me, has been something that I've always enjoyed. If you enjoy it, you, you'll do it. I mean, it's either you like pressure or you don't like pressure. If you don't like pressure, thank you very much. <laughs> Look at other options. I know it's stressful, um, but it's just, you know, the more chaos, the more lovely it gets, you know. Uh, you sort of, like, you light up. <laughs> you light up and you, you, you do what has to be done. The more time I spend at the Charlotte McCleckey Hospital, the more I'm seeing the difference this young team is making to the trauma unit's extraordinary success rate. My experience at the Charlotte McCleckey Hospital in Johannesburg is proving intense. They specialize in treating violent injuries here. He's the victim of a stabbing. He's been stabbed in the back of the neck with a broken bottle. He's lost quite a lot of blood. He managed to walk as far as this trauma unit. In a place with so much violence, things are sometimes taken in surprisingly good humour. You've had a bit of a rough night with this uh, injury you've got here. In the head? Yeah. Yes, it was a terrible one. Whoa. First time to happen to me. Oh, dear. What's happened? This guy happened to come and buy beer. Full beer, a coat, and I'm not drinking coats, I'm just drinking small ones. So he came and buy the coat next to me. He didn't open it, but he used my head to open that coat. Just, just hit me on the head. In between the mountain of cases, the junior doctors here are trying to squeeze in their exam revision. Cortisol is produced by the zona glomerulosa part of the junior... Where is it produced? Uh, Reticularis. Your final answer, gentlemen. False. False. Where is it, though? 
<laughs> I know, I wrote it beside fascic- you, I know it. Reticulata or fascicular, whatever. Fasciculata. Fasciculata. It's impossible not to like those guys, and they're kind of the hidden story of this place. They are young, and they've done things and seen things that an awful lot of people in other countries don't see an entire career, maybe never. Before long, there's a major test for one of the interns. Atanasio Matuol is 29. He's from Mozambique, but makes a living selling clothes in Joburg. He got stabbed in the back when he tried to break up a fight between two friends. The injury happened a few days ago. He was first patched up at another hospital. Now he's arrived here. Pravani has chosen to run this as a full resuscitation because he shows signs of what she called distress. In this case, uh, that's about the rate of his breathing. He's breathing very quickly. The team will treat him as though he has a significant penetrating chest injury until proven otherwise. So this is uh, an X-ray of this gentleman's chest. This very straight line here is blood sitting in the chest here, and that's the level of the blood here. So he's been injured from outside. It's caused air to accumulate in the chest, and the blood has accumulated to the bottom in the space there. So his problem at the moment is that he can't breathe properly because all of his right side of his chest, all the on the right side of his chest, his right lung has collapsed down uh, by both the blood and the air. They need to get that blood out and re-expand the lung. And once again, that means a chest drain. These can be tricky procedures, even for experienced doctors. This is our intern. She's going to be doing it. It's her first IC drain. The job will be done by Matifo, a newly qualified South African doctor. She's never done this before. After you make your incision, you have to push through the chest wall and the tough layers of muscle that lie between the ribs. And that's only half the picture, because you have to avoid the delicate network of nerves, arteries and veins that run just below each rib. That's why you only use a scalpel for the initial incision. Then you open a gap with a blunt pair of forceps, piercing and gaining access to the chest cavity. We have to do this, okay? All right, sorry, I know you're in a lot of pain. It takes Matifo a while, but she finally gets there. Once that tube is in, it drains a lot of blood. The rule in this trauma unit is if it stops before 1.2 litres has collected in the bottle, then the patient should be okay and can avoid a trip to the operating theatre. Atanasio's drain stops just short of that limit. Once the blood has drained, recovery can come surprisingly quickly. Only minutes later, Atanasio is well enough to call his family. He looks much better, doesn't he? And, and the reason is, if you come over here, is this is the before and after drain chest x-rays. And before, if you remember, all that blood in, in the right side of the chest uh, and all of that air on his right side has been drained away. This is after the drain's been played. This is the drain, this rather big drain here, placed in, going through the chest wall, up into the top of the lung, has, dra- has la- allowed the r- lung to re-expand. That kind of cloudy shadowing you can see is his lung coming back into place. And the blood's gone. So that's why he feels better. I thought it was easy, but it's not as easy as it looks, because it was quite hard for me. It took me a while. And... Um, Yeah, but I'm proud of myself that I finally did it.
There's something about the chest strain, I think, as a procedure, because it's not quite like the other things that you do for the first time, the first cannula, the first central line. The fact that I thought I was about to break a rib, <laughs> so that was surprising. But otherwise... why? Why did you think you were about to break a rib? Because you have to push hard, you know, like when you insert so the tube. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, yeah. So I thought I was about to break the poor guy's rib. Atanasio was discharged from hospital after four weeks. Stitch. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm feeling nice now. Yeah, I'm happy for daughter. Né? Yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks, God. Thanks, daughter. Yes. I want to see where all this violence is coming from. Getting higher. Hi, You're going to hi. show me around, I hear. Hey, let's go. Cool. You're going to... And see Johannesburg. Kenneth O'Connor has been a paramedic in Joburg for 20 years. While many parts of Joburg are calm and prosperous, I'm headed to one of the most dangerous parts of the city. Um, this is Hilbra. This is it. Hilbra during the day, it's like this. Hilbra during the night is... You never know what's going to happen. A life is, is worth nothing. A cell phone is more important than a life. You can shoot someone in the chest for your cell phone, for his cell phone, and go and sell it for 200 grand. And someone getting stabbed for a pair of shoes. How do you justify that? But there is some good news. The South African government have cracked down hard on guns. You can get up to 15 years in prison just for being in possession. Did you used to see more in the way of shootings before? Gun control is uh, all the firearm legislation that's been brought in has done wonders. But what has replaced it, it seems, is this epidemic of knife crime, what one of the junior doctors called stabbing as a national sport here. Is that, is that a fair depiction? As long as I've been working here, stabbings have been there. Knives and bottles and any of those other bicycle spokes or shanks or whatever will still be there. So to try and have people not carrying knives, I don't know if we could ever get past that. In places like Hillbrow, you don't have to go in search of violence. One day, it just finds you. John Bellow was stabbed several times just for his mobile phone. He just asked for my mobile phone and money from me. They had to eat. And I intended to give it to them, but I didn't know what happened. I wanted to bring out the phone from my pocket, but they, maybe they're thinking, maybe I'm going to remove something in my pocket, and they never listened to me. They begin to stop me. What both John and paramedic Ken tell me helps me understand a large part of the picture. New gun controls mean that injuries caused by shootings have halved. But this has led stabbings to increase. The total number of injuries from violent assault has gone up over the last five years. But here's the really important thing. Stabbing is a much more survivable entity. Here, they are experts in treating it. And so the number of people who are dying overall has dropped. I'm nearing the end of my time in Joburg, and I want to piece together all the clues I've seen to the success they have here. It's my last day following the trauma teams at the Charlotte McClecke unit. I want to piece together just how this trauma system works and why 90% of their severely injured patients survive. Is he flat? The latest emergency is a man found by the roadside. He's unconscious and has a serious head injury. Last time, did you call for call Risa, sir? Did you call Prof? He's a victim of a hit and run. This is the most unstable period of, of, of any trauma call, you know, the opening minutes. Professor Jacques Houston arrives to oversee his junior trauma team. I watch him stand back, giving his team the space and responsibility to do their job. But he steps in as soon as it becomes clear that they need assistance. So he doesn't have enough oxygen in his bloodstream to keep him going at the moment. His sats are at 62%, and, that, and that's real. Uh, and that might be all the injury to his chest. There might be blood in his airway, I don't know. They need to intubate him. 
now. So that's our 80%. Beautiful, well done. Good job. What they're doing at the top there with the, with the bag is, is the thing that's saving his life at the moment. And so there are many things that might kill this patient, but lack of oxygen is what it's all about. So this is the intubation. Down it goes. That's our full 91. Still maintaining cricoid pressure. What Prof Houston is doing now is checking that the tube's in the right place. Okay. Probably stuck it right down to the anus, get it back to the tube. Focus slowly, we're okay, we're in There's a tube now connecting the oxygen to his lungs, protecting his airway from soiling with blood or whatever else there is there. And that intervention there, that on his own, is going to keep him alive, at least for now. After 15 minutes, the team does manage to stabilize his condition. As soon as the patient is OK, and whilst he's still on the bed in front of them, Prof seizes the chance to make sure the right lessons are learned. OK, let's get all the guys together. I just want all, the, all, all of the team together. Let's just run through the research. You see that you struggle lifting the jaw. Yeah. So that's why you have one doctor lifting or one nurse lifting jaw and getting that seal. Therefore you have one bagging. And did you have a big B problem? Did you have a threat to life? Yes. What? Um, threat to life in his chest? No. Nothing. nothing. Okay, nothing. sir. Did you have a C problem? No. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you had no yes, BP yes. when he came in. Was the central line necessary with that blood pressure? No. Okay, so all in all, good. But especially for all of us, if you're not doing something that's part of the protocol and contributing to the guy, step back. How do you think it went? I think for this time of the year, where we're dealing with junior staff who have just rotated in, it's barely acceptable to, that the actions were carried out, but they needed prompting and they needed correction. But that training, that training experience is necessary in this unit because the same doctors who are quite early in the year of their training here now, you, you may have to rely upon them well, next week the registrar and myself would be in theatre, could be in theatre. We could be dealing with a major trauma where we one simply cannot leave the patient. I have to allow them the scope to learn and train. Hence the feedback afterwards. Next week, if we had not allowed them to get on with it, there would be a dead patient. Your initial impression of this place is, you know, a bunch of junior doctors thrown in at the deep end, sometimes waving, sometimes drowning, and actually, actually when you look up close, and often someone very senior, just there in the wings, ready to step in, and that's, that's a big part of why this place actually works. In a place that throws up so much devastation, I'm interested to hear how the doctors cope. Uh, she had one 14 gauge in the left, anticubular fossa, and we put a catheter in her. Sarah, who I'd seen using a hammer and chisel to save Bongani, talks to me about this. Frankly, you're constantly faced with quite a lot of misery. And after a while, it can take a toll on you. And you have to make decisions as to how, to, how you deal with that. But do you take it home? Do you take your patients home with you? Yeah. OK. We all do it. And, and trauma surgeons do it just as, uh, uh, the same as, as anyone else. Every surgeon has a personal graveyard. And every now and again, you go and visit it. And you remember some of those patients who um, you wish you could have changed. And there are patients who you feel that if circumstances had been different, maybe, maybe something could have been different. My week following the trauma teams at the Charlotte McCleckey Hospital is at an end. Despite its shoestring budget, 
How does this trauma unit manage to save nine out of 10 of its emergency admissions? Success with gun control has helped reduce the number of fatalities. Less guns means more knives. My concern is that he's got a stab um, to the pericardium to the heart. But seeing over 700 stab victims each year has helped this unit build up an incredible expertise. I'm proud of myself that I finally did it. But for me, the most important thing is that here, young doctors are given real responsibility early on. And whilst this seems surprising at first glance, the top-class supervision means they learn incredibly fast. I've had a look through it all. I've had a look through the protocols, I've had a look through the system, I've had a look at the way their building's set up, I've had a look through their trauma rooms. I've been searching for what it is that makes Charlotte McLecke Trauma Unit, Joburg General, special. Uh, and it is without doubt special. You look at their statistics, the outcomes they have, the huge volume of trauma they see, and they're very, very good. But the thing at the bottom of it, the essential thing, the essence of this unit, is the people. Yeah. Thanks nice very much. Yeah. Nice meeting you. Bye-bye, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bye-bye. Thank you very much. Nice Take care.